So now Hume turns to looking at the notion of concern, memory, and we'll get to his conclusion. So much like our good dead friend John Locke, Hume connects our concerns about identity with concerns about our passions uh, and feelings, etc. And so he says that our passions corroborates the imagination. So, you know, what he seems to be saying is that we imagine this connection, but also our feelings seem to enforce it as well. How so? Well, our feelings lead us to regard our distant perceptions as influencing influencing each other. And this, much as Locke said, gives us a concern for our past and our future. Then he heads into memory. Now, you might recall from our good dead friend John Locke, for Locke, memory seems to be the basis of personal identity. That is, you know, as far as your consciousness goes, that's you. Now, Hume takes a different approach. He says that memory alone acquaints us with this continuance and extent of the succession of perceptions. And so for him, it is the source of personal identity. And he asserts, seemingly correctly, that if we didn't have a memory, we would have no notion of causation. And if we had no notion of causation, we'd have no notion of the chain of causes and effects that make up our self, which certainly seems reasonable. You know, if you have no memory, you would have no you know, notion of a continuing self because you need a memory to have this notion of continuing self. And he asserts, once we have this notion of causation from memory, we can extend that chain of causes and our identity beyond our memory. So we can accept that there are circumstances, actions, and things we did, but forgot, but suppose they, they do exist. So sort of intuitively, we accept that our existence, our identity extends beyond our memory. And so next we'll head into looking at memory. So now Hume turns to looking at the notion of concern, memory, and we'll get to his conclusion. So much like our good dead friend John Locke, Hume connects our concerns about identity with concerns about our passions uh, and feelings, etc. And so he says that our passions corroborates the imagination. So you know, what he seems to be saying is that we imagine this connection, but also our feelings seem to enforce it as well. How so? Well, our feelings lead us to regard our distant perceptions as influencing each other. And this, much as Locke said, gives us a concern for our past and our future. Then he heads into memory. Now, you might recall from our good dead friend John Locke, for Locke, memory seems to be the basis of personal identity. That is, you know, as far as your consciousness goes, that's you. Now, Hume takes a different approach. He says that memory alone acquaints us with this continuance and extent of the succession of perceptions. And so for him, it is the source of personal identity. And he asserts, seemingly correctly, that if we didn't have a memory, we would have no notion of causation. And if we had no notion of causation, we'd have no notion of the chain of causes and effects that make up our self, which certainly seems reasonable. You know, if you have no memory, you would have no you know, notion of a continuing self because you need a memory to have this notion of continuing self. And he asserts, once we have this notion of causation from memory, we can extend that chain of causes and our identity beyond our memory. So we can accept that there are circumstances, actions, and things we did, but forgot, but suppose they, they do exist. So sort of intuitively, we accept that our existence, our identity extends beyond our memory. And so next we'll head into looking at memory. So Hume, in his conclusion, ends up taking this view. Even though he seemed to have ended with a person as a bundle of perceptions, united by causation, he ends up saying that all questions concerning personal identity can never possibly be decided. So what are we to do instead? Well, he says, 
We must regard them as grammatical rather than philosophical. That is to say, it's a verbal dispute, and which is something that philosophers are often accused of doing, just arguing about words rather than anything, you know, significant. So why think this? Well, he does actually have reasons for this, and here they are. He claims that identity depends on the relation of ideas that produce that alleged identity. And this is produced through what he says is an easy transition they occasion. In other words, we attribute identity to you know ourselves, like I, I attribute identity to me, personal identity, because the relation of ideas, you know, the resemblance uh, going back, seems to make this easy transition. I, I look back and say, okay, I can trace this seeming causal chain and resemblance and say, yep, that's me going all the way back. But then he notes this. Since the relations and easiness of the transition may insensibly diminish, we have no just standard to settle disputes concerning when they acquire or lose title to identity. So what he's saying here, to use a metaphor, you can think of that extending back as kind of like a rope. And as it goes back and back and back, it gets, you know, it starts to get weak and frayed and faded. And at a certain point, looking way, way back, you really can't say if the rope really does extend all the way back, you know, because it, you lose sight of it, it becomes all faded and frayed, etc. And so you can't specify at what point it's you and which point it's not you. And so because of this, because we, we can't definitively say, he says, all disputes about identity are merely verbal, except insofar as this relation yields a fiction or imaginary principle of union. So what he essentially says is because we really can't specify the identity, it's all just a matter of words, just sort of fighting over where the word I applies and doesn't apply. And, but it's all essentially imaginary, that we there is no you know real connection, and we're basically battling over a fiction. So sort of his end view is this. He burns the metaphysical view kind of down to the ground and says it's all a battle over you know the words, and there's only fiction and imagination there, and that makes a pretty good segue to. Uh, Buddha's no self doctrine, because as we'll see, uh, whereas human ends up with its all imagination, Buddha begins with there is no self.